Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's update on COVID-19 in New Brunswick. Speaking on behalf of the province today are the province's Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Jennifer Russell, and the Honorable Dominic Cardi, Minister of Education and Early Childhood Development. Bonjour tout le monde et bienvenue à cette mise à jour sur le COVID-19 au Nouveau-Brunswick. Les pop parleurs aujourd'hui sont la médecin hygiéniste en chef, la Dr. Jennifer Russell, et le ministre de l'Éducation et du Développement de la Petite Enfance, l'Honorable Dominic Cardi. Dr. Russell. Thank you, Bruce. Good afternoon, everyone. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Today, we'll, I will be reporting on the status of the current outbreaks of COVID-19 across New Brunswick, including those in several adult residential facilities, the importance of adhering to the of adhering to public health guidance and advice and progress on our vaccination campaign. This new wave of the COVID-19 pandemic is proving to be more challenging than any we have experienced to date. ...on the status of the current outbreaks of COVID-19 across New Brunswick, including those in several adult residential facilities, the importance of adhering to public health guidance and advice, and progress on our vaccination campaign. This new wave of COVID-19 is proving to be more challenging than any we have experienced to date. In the first wave, we saw limited outbreaks in one or two regions at a time. Now we have numerous cases reported in five of our seven health zones. No corner of our province has been left untouched. We are seeing multiple outbreaks in nursing homes and adult residential facilities in several communities, putting new stress on residents, staff, families, and caregivers. There have been confirmed cases in several schools, as Minister Cardi will report on during this briefing. Pour la huitième journée de suite, le nombre de nouveaux cas de COVID-19 que nous avons... We have reached today 800 confirmed cases since the start of the pandemic. And for the eighth consecutive day, we'll report on a double-digit increase in new cases. More than 1,700 New Brunswickers are now in self-isolation after coming into contact with a confirmed case of COVID-19. This situation is an unprecedented disruption in their lives as well as in the communities in which they live. Double-digit increase in new cases. We have today reached 800 confirmed cases since the start of the pandemic. More than 1,700 New Brunswickers are now in self-isolation after coming into contact with a confirmed case of COVID-19. This represents an unprecedented disruption in their lives as well as the communities in which they live. And all this is happening as we accelerate our efforts to vaccinate those at highest risk from COVID-19. Now, more than ever, it is absolutely vital that every New Brunswicker follows public health guidance and advice so that we can slow the further spread of this disease. As every region of the province is at the orange alert level, this means wearing a mask when you are out in public, both indoors and outdoors. It, it means maintaining two meters of physical distance from others at all times. It means staying home from work or school when you don't feel well. If you are experiencing any symptoms of COVID-19, no matter how trivial they may seem to you, please stay away from others and arrange for testing as soon as possible. It's very important to be tested. ...is at the orange alert level. This means wearing a mask when you are out in public, both indoors and outdoors. It means maintaining two meters of physical distance from others at all times. It means staying home from work or school when you don't feel well. If you are experiencing any symptoms of COVID-19, no matter how trivial they may seem to you, please stay away from others and arrange for testing as soon as possible. It is very important that each and every individual who has symptoms get tested. If you have not already done so, please download the COVID Alert app to your phone. This will greatly assist in our contact tracing teams to swiftly identify contacts and get them into isolation. It's critical that all New Brunswickers download the app. If we do all of these things, we will be improving our chances of slowing the pace of this outbreak and putting our province back into the path of recovery. 
It also will protect us against future outbreaks, as well as the risks of the UK variant entering our province and taking hold here. Today, there are 21 new confirmed cases of COVID-19 in the province. The new cases are as follows. In Zone 1, which is the Moncton and Southeast New Brunswick area, there are four new cases. In Zone 3, which is the Fredericton and St. John River Valley, seven new cases. In Zone 4, which is the Edmonston Grand Falls area, six new cases. In Zone 5, which is the Camelton Restigouche region, four new cases. There are now 204 active cases of COVID-19 across the province more than we have seen at any time since the pandemic began last March. There is one person in the hospital at this time, and I ask that you direct your thoughts and prayers to everyone now being impacted by this pandemic in every corner of our province. There are 21 new confirmed cases uh, for COVID-19 in the province. Uh, and there are in Zone 1, and with, for Moncton Southeast, there are four new cases. Zone 3, Fredericton and the St. John Va River Valley, seven new cases. In Zone 4, there are six new cases, the Edmonston Grand Falls area. And Zone 5, which is the Camelton Ristigouche region, four new cases. There are now 204 active cases of COVID 19 across the province more than we have seen at any time since the pandemic began last March. And one person who, with COVID-19, is hospitalized at this time. Adult residential facilities whose residents are particularly vulnerable to the COVID-19 virus. I am pleased to report that there are no new confirmed cases at these homes in St. John, Riverview, Hillsborough and Baker Brook. Our prompt teams are working with staff in each of these facilities to manage care and slow the spread of infection, and they are doing an excellent job. So I'm really, really proud of the work that they're doing right now. A new round of testing for residents and staff at Parkland St. John will be taking place today. To date, 14 residents and 10 staff members have tested positive. Testing will take place tomorrow at Canterbury Hall in Riverview and Foyer St. Elizabeth uh, in Baker Brook. At Fundy Royal Manor in Hillsborough, where there have been two confirmed cases, there will be a further round of testing for residents and staff on Thursday. I can also inform you that a prompt team has been deployed to assist at uh, Tobik First Nation. As shipments of approved COVID-19 vaccines arrive in the province, we are moving to inoculate New Brunswickers. This is a very slow process because there is such a limited supply of vaccines right now, but there will be a bigger supply over the course of the next several months. We are beginning with most vulnerable to this disease, residents of long-term care facilities and frontline healthcare workers. As the supply increases in the weeks and months ahead, the vaccine will become available to all New Brunswickers. Dès que les, les lots de vaccins approuvés contre le COVID-19 arrivent au New Brunswick, yeah. As shipments of approved COVID-19 vaccines arrive in the province, we are going to inoculate New Brunswickers, and we are beginning with those who are most vulnerable to this disease, residents of adult residential facilities, the elderly, and frontline health care workers. As the supply increases in the weeks and months ahead, the vaccine will become available to all New Brunswickers. As hard as we can to get everyone protected. We have improved our capacity to deliver vaccines that require ultra cold storage with the delivery of a new freezer of new freezer units to regional hospitals in several zones. To highlight our vaccination effort, we are adding numbers to the New Brunswick COVID-19 dashboard, which is available online, and we will be updating these numbers weekly. Um, we do know that people have a lot of questions about the vaccination program. Whether you're a layperson, whether you're somebody in the public, whether you're a healthcare worker, our website has an excellent uh, frequently asked questions document. Please read this document. It's very, very helpful. There is also an email address where if you have further questions, you can email us and ask your questions. Uh, to date, we administered a total number of 7,732 doses. The remaining 3,443 doses which we have received will ensure we can provide the second injection, the booster dose, to those that were immunized in our first clinics. Pour illustrer nos efforts en matière d'immunisation, we will be adding uh, to the uh, dashboard uh, the uh, we'll be adding uh, numbers to the COVID-19 dashboard, which is available online, and they'll be updated regularly. And uh, 
and we will talk about how we'll be giving lots of information there. And if you have questions, there's an email there that where you can send your questions as well. We know that people have many questions and we are trying to answer them. To date, we administered a total number of 7,732 doses. We're holding back 3,443 doses, which we have received to ensure that we can provide the second injection to those inoculated in their clinics. Edmonston, Fredericton, and St. John, focusing on our priority groups. But if we are to protect the vulnerable and those at the front lines, we must also protect our vaccination effort. We must ensure that those who are giving the vaccines remain healthy. We must make sure that the healthcare workers are able to get the vaccine as soon as it becomes available for them. To keep us healthy, we need to keep them healthy. Lorsque vous respectez les consignes et les directives de santé publique, vous vous protégez vous-même. When you follow public health guidelines and advice, you're protecting yourself and your families against this very serious disease. You're also protecting our ability to move forward with our vaccination campaign, which will help bring this pandemic to an end. This will take another six to nine months, so you have to be patient. Also, we want to thank all the people who are working on contact tracing, they're working very hard. And if you have to speak them on the phone, do thank them. Protecting yourselves and your families against this very serious disease, as well as the potential for the UK variant to take hold here in New Brunswick. So all of our efforts are around keeping COVID-19 out of New Brunswick and keeping it from spreading once it gets here. You are also protecting our ability to move forward with our vaccination campaign, which will help bring this pandemic to an end. I am profoundly grateful for all the efforts that New Brunswickers are making to help slow the spread of COVID-19. Your actions are truly heroic because lives are being saved. Please keep doing what you have been doing. Please, with kindness, with empathy, encourage your family, friends, and neighbors to follow your example. We can all get through this. If we get through this, we must work together, and that is what we have been doing thus far. Please, with kindness and empathy, encourage your friends and family and neighbors to follow your example. We can all get through this if we get through this, if we work at this together. Thank you. Bon après-midi, bienvenue. So, uh, as has been already reported, we had a number of positive cases of COVID-19 impacting schools in zones three and five, which were confirmed over the course of the weekend. In addition to the confirmed case at Besborough School in Moncton announced last week, positive cases of COVID-19 have been confirmed at Woodstock High School and Townsview High School, or school rather, in Woodstock, Académie Notre-Dame and École aux Quatre Vents in Dalhousie, and the polyvalent Roland Pepin in Campbellton. So in Cap Positive... A positive case was also confirmed last Friday at the Tic-Tac-Toe day Daycare Centre in the Académie Notre-Dame in Dalhousie. Over the past week, uh, positive cases were recorded in six uh, early childhood centres. I want to thank the owners and educators for their remarkable collaboration and their quick intervention. It's greatly appreciated. You have all shown lots of character despite the pressure. I am proud to see that we can count on people of New Brunswick as remarkable as you who take to heart the health and safety of the, our youngest learners in our province. Take this opportunity to remind families that if there is a confirmed positive case or possible exposure to COVID-19 in a school or in a childcare facility, families and the school community will be notified directly. And otherwise, for folks outside of those groups, no news is good news. So we're committed to keeping you as informed and up to date with information as soon as it becomes available, but we're also gonna do our best to continue to protect the privacy of staff and students 
as required by the Personal Health Information Privacy and Access Act. So for today, students at Académie Notre Dame, École aux Quatre Vents, Woodstock High School and Townsview School will be staying home for an operational response day. That means getting the school cleaned up, getting things ready if we do have to go for online learning, taking those necessary steps. But for tomorrow, January 12th, students at Woodstock High and Townsview School will begin learning online for the rest of this week. The students at l'école aux quatre vents will also be learning virtually, but will be back in, cl in class on January 25th, unless otherwise noted. Most students at Académie Notre Dame will be back in class starting tomorrow, with a few classes being offered virtually. Communi contacts will continue be directly between the schools and the parents and families, and given what could happen over the next few days, depending on the availability of supply teachers. Grades 9, 12, 11, and 12 uh, students uh, at the Prévent de Roland Pépin have returned to school as usual today, while those who are in 10th grade will be learning virtually. Today, while a handful of classes continued to be taught online. And I know this situation is stressful for families and anxieties are high at a time when, as Dr. Russell has pointed out, we have cases across the province and we are facing our most difficult moment since March, and I would argue perhaps even more difficult than that, as the virus is now not a faraway threat but is all around us, submerging provinces and states and our frontiers, and we're seeing that leakage into our province. And everything that we can do to push it back, we're going to continue to try to do. But after months of COVID regulations, after months of restrictions, I get that people are tired and frustrated and a little bit fed up. And you layer in on top of that the justifiable fear that comes from having to deal with a deadly pandemic. And that just makes me all the more appreciative to be a New Brunswicker and to hear the stories that I hear every day from across the province, the people doing the right thing and making the right sacrifices to keep this deadly disease at bay. So I want to thank everyone again for their tolerance, and their kindness, their patience, and the fact that they are keeping front of mind every day, the citizens of this province, the need to follow the directions from public health so we can get through this, these last few weeks before the vaccine rollout starts to pick up. So I know lots of folks have still got questions on how decisions are made on when to close schools or who moves to online learning. And those decisions are made using the comprehensive risk assessments by public health to ensure that our responses align with the associated triggers and alert levels, the color phases and so on that we've all become comfortable with. We also consider the operational requirements for keeping schools open. Do we have enough custodians? Do we have enough bus drivers, teachers? Those are the normal sort of operational concerns that guide the school's decisions every day on whether or not they can open or not. Sometimes in the past, flu outbreaks have caused schools to have to consider closing temporarily. So this isn't exceptional or unusual, but it's still an enormous headache. So we have to look at, well, as how the transition to online learning can cause additional problems itself. Because blended learning has absolutely made it easier for high school students to continue home learning for a few weeks if necessary and why government put in place the measures to do as, as best as possible, connect all high school students with a device and with an internet connection that allow them to work online. This weekend, for example, while contact tracing was carried out in the Woodstock area, we ended up with roughly 1,400 staff and students who were asked to isolate for 48 hours as a result of those uh, four cases in the Woodstock sco schools. So we absolutely, again, are ready if we have to, to move online but we really want to try and avoid it whenever we can because our, our plans are designed to keep our students safe. And one of the most inspiring things I've heard was when Dr. Russell said that if her kids had to go to, the, go to school in Orange, she would have no problem sending them to school in Orange. And you can see that even in Orange, we're taking steps to close schools when we have to for short or longer periods of time. Because as long as I'm minister, I can tell you we are not going to hesitate from listening to the advice of public health and taking the right steps to protect our staff and our students, but that as much as possible means keeping schools open, not closing them down. So talking about all those people in, in uh, Woodstock, over a thousand folks involved in the school system, having to isolate over a weekend when the schools aren't even open. I want to thank them for their compliance. 
which is a dry kind of word, but it basically means they're stepping up as citizens, doing the right thing even though it's inconvenient, even though it's difficult. They help the contact tracers, and I'd reiterate Dr. Russell's call to be kind to the contact tracers if you have the opportunity to talk to them directly. And I'll repeat something I believe I've said from this podium before. There's, if there is a group of people in this province to whom we all owe an enormous debt of gratitude, it's the contact tracers who have ferreted out and run down cases of COVID-19 across New Brunswick from the beginning of this pandemic. And every time when I've woken up during the course of this outbreak and wondered every day whether this would be the day when we'd see broad community transmission of COVID-19, and then finding that no, the contact tracers did their job, that they got things back under control, it's an incredible testament to their hard work and dedication and to the honesty and participation of New Brunswickers. So again, we knew from the outset that this situation was going to be causing significant operational impacts on both of those schools in Woodstock. That's why we made that decision to move those students to home learning for just for the next week. Alors, nous avons toujours dit que nous... So we've always said that we would use a home learning whenever necessary, but we will we'll properly think out this uh, th properly think out this decision. Remember that the mission is to make sure that each child can have access to top quality education. We have to offer a safe and healthy uh, learning of learning areas and that's why we have put plans in place so, so that schools can stay open even if there are only a few uh, cases to ensure that students can continue to attend school and to access the programs and supports that are offered through the education system programs that can be as basic as making sure that students have food in their stomach to be able to get through the day the mental health supports that many students require, the social engagement that all humans need to be able to get through their days and weeks. We can only do that if everyone helps Dr. Russell, me, and the rest of the team keep our schools open. And that's why it's critical that New Brunswickers continue to wear their mask, meet virtually whenever possible, keep your distance, wash your hands, and generally follow the advice of public health. Listen to Dr. Russell. Over the course of the weekend, I heard from someone I'm close to that her son decided that the best response to the province going orange was to drive to St. John from Fredericton for the express purpose of buying chicken. She said, and this is a woman who's recently come through surgery, she said, like, what are you doing? How could you be putting people at risk? And apparently responded, LOL. Meanwhile, someone else I'm close to has been following the rules for self-isolation and more and has hardly seen anyone for weeks and weeks, a situation that so many people living alone in this province have had to endure over recent months. And it's those people in that second category, and I know because she asked me, so it's kind of hard to sit here at home alone when you know that some people are really choosing to do the wrong thing for the wrong reasons. So I want to make it really clear that when Dr. Russell stands up here, or I do, or anyone else from government, and we make these pleas for people to wear their masks, we know that nearly everyone is listening. We know that nearly everyone is paying attention, and we know that's why New Brunswick is doing so well in combating this pandemic. But for those few out there who refuse to take this seriously, open your eyes, turn on the news. Look at the emergency rooms being overwhelmed across this continent and around the world. Imagine if it was people you cared about being in that situation. Don't do it. Don't make a decision now that you're going to regret for the rest of your life. A selfish, tiny day-to-day -day decision like going to a, a restaurant in another health zone? Come on. We are better than this. But when I say that, say that message with that tone that is directed at the tiny minority of people who are refusing to listen to the advice that's put us in a position that is still enviable in comparison to the rest of the world. There are so many layers of protection, as Dr. Russell has talked about regularly, but they're only effective when they're all used together. We have to continue acting as if COVID-19 could happen 
anywhere. We have to continue to be v vigilant. The precautions and the health measures that we are taken are meant to protect us and others. As you know, the situation can change quickly. We are asking the families to continue to be vigilant and to continue to keep informed by watching their emails and phones for all updates. Okay, questions. I'd like to remind parents and students of a couple of new services that are available to them. IT support. It's available for students and staff who experience any connectivity issues related to online learning. So I'd ask folks who are listening, pay attention to these numbers and this info, because it might not be your school, students and your family who are affected by this today, but it could be tomorrow or next week. Help is available through the Bell Call Center at 1-833-453-1140. One eight three three four five three one one four zero. More information on these services have been sent home through your schools. Virtual counseling sessions and a variety of other wellness and mental health services are available directly through our schools. We're committed to continuing the hard work of keeping our schools open so students can keep learning, growing, and engaging with each other in a health, healthy and safe environment. And again, want to thank everyone in the schools, the districts, and the department for all their collaboration over the past few days. And again, to thank Public Health and those contact tracers for their incredible work and their support in keeping all New Brunswickers safe. Over the past few months, we required a lot of experience in managing cases in schools. And I am convinced that with your help and your collaboration and goodwill, we will be able to get over these challenges quickly and safely. When it's had contact, with the virus so far, let's keep it up. The plan is only as good as those of us who are willing to follow it. So let's keep working together. As Dr. Russell said, we're almost there. Let's do it. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Ministre Dr. Russell. Thank you, Dr. Russell and Mr. Cardi. Nous allons maintenant procéder aux questions des journalistes. Vous avez toujours le droit de poser vos questions dans la langue de votre choix. Voulez-vous assurer de désactiver le son de vos micros, s'il vous plaît? Chaque journaliste aura une question et un suivi. We'll now proceed with questions from members of the media. You have the right to pose your question in the language of your choice. Please ensure your microphones are placed on mute, and each reporter will have one question and a quick follow-up. Silas Brown, Global TV. Hi, Dr. Russell. Uh, you mentioned uh, that it's, uh, it's critical that more New Brunswickers uh, download the COVID alert app. Uh, I'm curious uh, what public health is seeing in terms of uptake and, and how low that uptake really is for the app at this point. Uh, the last number I had uh was that we were around 9% compared to other provinces. But uh, again, we really um, don't have a great breakdown of that just because they released the information for the entire country. But it would be helpful if people did download it now. Again, during the, these outbreaks would be very, very helpful, but it also would be helpful for future outbreaks. And certainly if the UK variant were introduced here, uh, the rate that that would be uh, transmitted would be so great that, um, so high rather, that the COVID-19 app would be very, very, very crucial in helping us contain it. Mr. Brown, do you have a follow-up? Yes, yeah, so I'm curious about how uh, contact tracing is going right now. Uh, is, is contact tracing overwhelmed? Are, are, are people being able to be reached in a timely fashion? Can, can we get an update on how that's going? My understanding is it's going well. Uh, they, they knew they were going to have challenges with the schools in the Woodstock area over the weekend, so that's why they had asked everybody to self-isolate during that time uh, so that they could make sure that if it was going to take up to 48 hours, then all of those people would be self-isolating during that time. Um, so that was very, very helpful. So they were able to get through the entire list of the students. There were about 1,400 people that they had to contact. So again, that worked very well uh, to have everybody stay in place while that was happening and, and self-isolate. Um, yeah, my understanding is it's, it's going well. Um, our, our team is working so hard. I mean, uh, I was at the NBHOC, uh, the 
uh, Health Emergency Operations Centre this weekend and, and the staff there, you know, lots of energy, lots of enthusiasm to keep going. Uh, everybody's working hard to protect New Brunswickers right now and a lot of New Brunswickers are doing the same. So I want to thank everybody for their hard work. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Marie Sutherland, CBC. Hi, uh, my question is for Mr. Cardi. Um, the Atlantic Education International Program is soon going to be receiving foreign students who will be billeted with families and enrolled in schools uh, around the province. Can you tell us how many students are coming into New Brunswick through this program this week and what it will take to accommodate their isolation for 14 days? Sure, thanks. I don't have those numbers here with me, but happy to get them as soon as possible after the press conference is done. Okay, we, I, when concerning the international students uh, uh, through the international uh, uh, program, I don't have the details with me at this time, but we'll try to get them for you after the press conference. Do you have a follow-up? I do, but first on this one, um, if we, don't, we may not have the exact numbers of students, but we probably do have plans for accommodating their isolation, and I'm just wondering what that is. Again, so the AEI is, uh, you happily make sure you get all those details. AEI is a, is a sort of quasi-independent organization who handles dealing with the, those questions, but we'll happily make sure that we get all that information back to you as quickly as possible. Follow-up? Okay, thank you. My follow-up is for Dr. Russell. Um, how many healthcare workers are off today for COVID-related reasons? And with cases continuing to rise, what's the plan to cover um, staffing if hospitals start to become overwhelmed? So the good news is, is that Vitalite and Horizon monitor this information on a daily basis. So combined, um, Vitalite and Horizon numbers are around 85 healthcare workers are self-isolating at home right now uh, for COVID-related reasons. Um, we They have a, quite a robust plan, actually, in terms of how to do the... Uh, reassignment and redeployment of staff. So again, that's monitored on a daily basis as well to make sure that if there are people that need to be redeployed to other areas um, that are critical, then they can do that. So, uh, so far that's been working very well. And, um, and uh, again, that the healthcare workers, that number of 85 also includes the um, uh, extramural and ambulance New Brunswick staff as well. Thank you, Ms. Sutherland. Vicki Hogarth, CHCO TV. Thank you, Bruce. Dr. Russell, can you please give us an update on the Pfizer vaccine clinic this past weekend? How many New Brunswickers received their second dose of the vaccine and are now fully vaccinated? And what was the feedback from that clinic? Um, I'll start with the feedback. Um, what we know about this, the second dose of the Pfizer vaccine is that if anybody's going to have a reaction, uh, usually it's to the second dose, the booster dose, as opposed to the first dose. Uh, so I think with the first doses, we just saw a regular kind of sore arm. Uh, I think this time we were seeing a bit more of the effects of the fatigue and, and aches and stuff, uh, stuff like that. Um, but in terms of the numbers, I think I read it in my speech. I feel like I had that, those numbers in terms of how many. So 1,862 1, people have received both doses of the Pfizer vaccine at this point in time. Do you have a follow-up, Ms. Hogarth? I do, for Dr. Russell. Dr. Russell, I'm wondering, how does public health monitor for the presence of the UK strain and the South African strain of the virus? And is there evidence to suggest that the two vaccines currently approved protect against these strains? So the conversations are ongoing at the national level around the variants. So the Special Advisory Committee and Public Health Agency of Canada and Health Canada are in conversations with, um, with the manufacturers about that. Pfizer has said that they could, um, that right now the UK variant will be covered by the current vaccine, but if there uh, was other, if there were other variants, um, such as the African variant, that they could uh, redesign the vaccine to cover that one as well in about six weeks. So that's the information that we have and we've been talking about at the national level. In terms of monitoring in this province, uh, we do have criteria in terms of sending the samples of somebody who's tested positive for COVID-19 to the National Microbiology Laboratory in Winnipeg. Uh, to help us uh, do that um, uh, identification identification of the UK strain. We so far have sent two samples out there of people who had traveled from the UK and tested positive for COVID, but they came back negative. The turnaround time is about a week. Um, so we'll continue to send uh, samples out there as need be, and we'll continue to monitor the transmission rates uh, and attack rates of any of the outbreaks that we see here that show anything uh, like uh, a variant effect. Thank you. Thank you.
Rose St. Pierre, Radio Canada. Oui, merci, Bruce. Ma question est pour. Thank you, Bruce. My, pr my question is for Minister Carty. What uh, are there any delays for any of the students, uh, given uh, what's been going on? Thank you for the question. Okay, uh, are we talking about for the upcoming fall session? Okay, for you know, for September and December, uh, are we expecting any delays? Uh, for for 2020, for okay, we still don't have the an analyses uh, done because uh, at this time f there are other. Uh, we are still uh, trying to get information as to what's happening in the schools, and we're going today. Our main work is to continue that the school system continue in a safe way and at the same time maintain a high quality. I'm looking forward to seeing the information when we get that and we see the impact on the success of uh, students in the province. And I think uh, it will things will be positive, but I don't want to add stress to the system today because there's already a lot of stress just to keep things going normally. <laughs> Follow up? Yes. Once again, for Mr. Cardi, how can we know that if the students are in school bubbles, but sometimes an entire school has to be quarantined and not just some classes? Thank you for that. If we, if health, uh, if public health tells us that there's a concern. If we hear about a, an outbreak in a community or in a school, it's important to expand our reaction to an entire school. Or sometimes maybe it'll be just one grade. For example, uh, it, uh, the grade 10 students aren't in school today, but those in grade 9, 11, and 12 are still in school. Okay. We're interested that uh, the reason why we usually move towards uh, closing down a whole school rather than just a, one class, if there's been an impact there, is on the advice of public safety if, or public health. If it's seen that there's more of a concern that uh, we have a case that, or cases that could be more easily spread, if the risk is there, that's when we close the schools down. And on impacts on learning from uh, last year, the short answer there is we're not looking at collecting that information and analyzing it right now. We're getting through this year. Once COVID-19 is behind us, we'll get that information make that analysis and make sure we roll it into our plans for getting school back to uh, a real normal after COVID, hopefully for September 2021. Merci. Thank you, Bruce. My question is for Dr. Russell. Now that there are fines for incomplete or false information given to contact tracers, does this mean that those who are undergoing interviews have remained to be unintentionally incriminating themselves during those interviews? I couldn't. All I heard was about people Slow not down. giving correct information. Slow it down. Can you repeat it again, Meg? Yeah, sorry about that. Can you hear me okay now? Perfectly. Okay, thank you. Now that there are fines for incomplete or false information given to contact tra tracers, does this mean that those who are undergoing interviews have immunity from potentially incriminating themselves during those interviews? Well, if they're not providing accurate information, um, I don't. Um, they would be susceptible to receiving fines if they if it is found out that they're not giving correct information on purpose, deliberately. Ms. Cunningham, do you have a follow up? I'm more so talking about um, people who may be engaging in illegal activity. If they disclose that to a contact tracer, can they incriminate themselves during that call? Can they be charged for that? I wouldn't be able to speak to that. You'd have to probably talk to somebody from Department of Public Safety. Uh, but with respect to giving accurate information around COVID-19 and their whereabouts and uh, the people that they've been in touch with, uh, in contact with, these are life and death pieces of information that our contact tracers need to protect the public. So we take that part very seriously. Obviously, if there's criminal activity that's going on that is is making them not want to disclose I, it doesn't really matter the reason why they don't want to disclose by not disclosing they're putting people's lives at risk 
Thank you, Ms. Cunningham. Mathieu Roy, comment la quête nouvelle? Dr. Russell, you said that there were more than 3,000 doses of, to give a second dose to people who had already gotten the first dose. At some point, this, the manufacturers were saying that you shouldn't wait and should give all the doses right away uh, because there would be enough doses to vaccinate everybody. Can you clarify all that and tell us why you're keeping some doses in reserve? A few different uh, reasons. One reason really is that we're living in New Brunswick. We don't know what's going to happen with weather and the roads uh, when it comes to delivery. And, and even people who are traveling to come and get their, their, their doses. I mean, it's a matter of safety. We know that people uh, want to get it, but if it was necessary, we would we know that the limit with Pfizer is about 28, 21 days, but could be more than that. And for the other, it's uh, 28 days. Major Woka move is followed. Yes, I'd like to know if you have any predictions concerning the moment where all the priority people, in other words, those staying in the special care homes and the first, uh, the the first line of health caregivers, when would that vaccination be done? So the campaign is being done in three phases, and the first phase is exactly that. The residents of uh, special care homes, uh, long-term uh, residences, as well as uh, those who as well as uh, adult uh, uh, First Nations people, all is based on the number of doses that we get, and we know that over the next uh, 12 weeks, we will be able to get all the doses we need to vaccinate this population. Monsieur Rocamo. Okay, those were my two questions, Bruce. Oh, thank you. Lower Lyle CTV. Hi there. Uh, my question is for Dr. Russell. Uh, Dr. Russell, have the residents of uh, Tucker Hall at Parkland St. John been removed from the current round of vaccinations? Um, and if they have, um, why? Well, we've had multiple discussions and we're having more discussions today about what the risks are of, of having vaccination uh, clinics held in places where there are outbreaks declared. So um, again, those discussions are ongoing, but the safest approach at this time was to not vaccinate people in a facility where there was an ongoing outbreak. Ms. Lyle, do you have a follow-up? I do. Um, is that due to um, our current supply of rapid tests? Um, and, and what is our current supply of rapid tests? Well, there's many things to take into consideration. It's not just about the testing, but just the fact that they're, they're, they're really con, 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 uh, con, focusing on cohorting, self-isolating, and there's already a number of staff that are deployed to just look after the outbreak. And again, it, it's really about logistics at this point in terms of just, again, trying to manage the resources as effectively as possible at this point in time. But again, the discussions are ongoing. And if it's decided that in future outbreak situations that we would consider immunizing people, then that's what we would do. But again, the, all the discussions that we've had with our regional medical officers of health and, and uh, other members of our public health team, it just wasn't the right approach for this particular time. Thank you. Andrew Waugh, Brunswick News. Now, yeah, hi, Dr. Russell. Um, so I was having a look at the numbers from the Atlantic provinces since uh, New Year's Eve. New Brunswick's had 200 new cases by my count. The next closest is Nova Scotia at 45, and PEI and Newfoundland and Labrador are, you know, in the low single digits. Why do you think it's so much worse here than in the rest of Atlantic Canada? Uh, a few reasons. Um one, we are kind of the gatekeepers of the rest of the, the maritime provinces, at least anyway, um, in terms of people coming across the Quebec border, coming, you know, anywhere from the rest of Canada, and then also the border with Maine. 
So we definitely have a lot of travelers coming into New Brunswick. We definitely had more travelers over the holiday season. We normally would have at any one time four to 5,000 people self-isolating as a result of uh, being a, a, a non-essential traveler. Over the Christmas holiday period season, we saw that number go up to 8,000 uh, people self-isolating as a result of non-essential travel. So that was a huge number of people added to our population who traveled and would have needed to self-isolate very safely uh, to prevent any spread. We also know that the gathering time, uh, the, ga the, the nature of that time frame is that there were people that were going to gather. And while we had set a, t a, a number of 20 as the maximum to gather, we wanted that to be the same consistent 20 over the entire course of the holiday period. So that would facilitate contact tracing in the event of an outbreak. What happened was that we ended up having people going to gatherings as well as workplace settings who were symptomatic. So that list of 20 contacts that we wanted everybody to stick to only worked if people didn't attend any of those functions with symptoms. So the message from the gatherings and what we learned was that you can tell people to self-isolate safely. That may or may not always work. So we're trying to bolster that information around how to self-isolate safely. We're also aware that people um, had attended gatherings or workplace settings with symptoms. So we're trying to message that people need to get tested even if they have very mild symptoms. Because once these cases happen, they spread to multiple different settings and locations around the province. So we're really, really understanding uh, what happened and we're trying to message again how to prevent the ongoing transmission at this point in time. So the best thing people can do is to self-isolate right away, get tested right away when they have any type of mild symptoms uh, that could be COVID-19 related. Thank you, Dr. Mr. Wad, do you have a follow-up today? I do, thank you. Um, Dr. Russell, what? Do the latest projections for, for New Brunswick show? I know that, you know, in April, early April, when COVID was nowhere near as big a problem as it is right now, there was a projection of 15 deaths by the end of the month. What, what do the numbers say now? Well, two things. One, at the national level, they are redoing all the modeling. Um, and uh, here in New Brunswick, we do constant modeling based on the actual outbreaks that we're experiencing um, so that we can help understand uh, what the worst case scenarios can be in whatever situation we're in and, and help prepare and prevent that from happening, uh, which we have to date been quite successful at managing. So we're going to continue to use that approach um, and, and hopefully, again, with all the measures that we have right in place right now and all the uh, communications uh, messaging that we have right now, hopefully we can get things uh, contained in, a, in the shortest amount of time possible with the least number of people being affected. Early in the pandemic, we had projections around, you know, 10% of cases would need hospitalization and 5% of those would need ICU admission. We've since looked at our data from every outbreak uh, during the pandemic and our numbers aren't quite exactly the same. They're not far off, but that's a ballpark uh, projection of, of what we have been seeing. But again, it depends on the demographic of the outbreaks and the cases, because as you know, um, most of the people that were affected in the zone five outbreak a few months ago were um, uh, an older population. So that would then drive the numbers up in terms of people that would need hospitalization and ICU admissions. So we're keeping an eye on it. We, we, we talk with Vitality and Horizon every single day to monitor the situation. And again, with all that information in mind, we can, uh, again, project out just uh, based on some of the ballpark uh, numbers to make sure that we're going in the right direction. Uh, but again, at the national level, there, there is more modeling happening. We probably will model um, what would happen with the new variant as well, because we've seen what's happening in the UK and, and that, um, you know, over the course of six weeks, how quickly that variant spread throughout the entire country. So um, so we're, we're definitely keeping a close eye on what's happening elsewhere and, and keeping that in mind when we're looking at what we need to do here in New Brunswick to prevent the UK variant from getting in as well as other variants and what to do to prevent their transmission once they get here and make sure that we detect them as soon as possible. Thank you, Mr. Wall. Thank you, Dr. Savannah Odd. Hi there. My question is for Dr. Russell. I'm wondering if you can tell me how many first doses of the COVID vaccine have been administered at long-term care homes in both staff and residents, and if either of those groups received the second dose as well. 
I, as of right now, the, the number of people that I know have received the second dose is, is uh, the number that I quoted not too long ago is about 1,862. Um, uh, but I don't have the breakdown of the residents versus healthcare workers. I could try to find that for you. I'm sure we have it. I just don't have it in front of me. Do you have another question? Ms. Ad, do you have a follow-up? Um, yes, sure. So I'm wondering whether we've observed any evidence of student-to-student -student transmission or student-to-teacher transmission or, you know, teacher-to-student uh, in schools to date. I don't have that information either. I know prior to these outbreaks, I'm pretty sure we hadn't seen that. Um, and when we talk about transmission, student to student or adult to student, um, we probably would be able to qualify that with the exposure setting. Because sometimes, actually, almost all the outbreaks, the exposures happened outside the school setting for the most part. Um, and, uh, and if there was any transmission, it was uh, adult to child versus child to adult and child to child. But I don't have the latest information from these outbreaks, but I can track that down as well. Thank you, Dr. David Caron. Yes, uh, things going well. My question is to Dr. Russell. So once again, there haven't been any cases in Zone 6 and 7. And so we're not going to complain about that. It, it's good that we've been spared that. But but since there's nothing happening, would uh, would there be any hypotheses to explain that? I mean, are we just model citizens, or the person not being, are people not being uh, tested? I think the number of people who were tested are uh, are quite adequate. I think it's just that the, the people didn't uh, travel in those uh, areas. So that means that uh, the virus didn't didn't travel with them. And I think those areas also had great rates when it came to uh, tests. So I don't know. During the, I mean, Region 7, yeah, there were 40 tests a day between December 7th and January 7th. And I think Region 7 had the second highest uh, screening rate in the province. So the only other region that had a higher rate was Region 4. But Region 5 as well, lots of tests were done. So I don't know. It may just be that people were doing exactly what they were supposed to do. So congratulations. And if there are any other uh, changes to make to uh, reward uh, those people in Zones uh, 7 and, f and uh, 5, I mean, great, great work. Mr. Caron, do you have a follow-up? Well, perhaps just to know... Are we going to continue the screening campaigns and try to get people tested even more just to maintain these uh, great results? Uh, certainly, it's always important for the entire province to continue to have tests when you have symptoms. It's very important. Over the next few months, we're going to try We want our immunization program continue to go safely. Timothy Jakes, Campbellton Tribune. Uh, yeah, my question's for uh, Dr. Russell. Uh, Vitality tells me uh, the COVID-19 vaccines are mandatory for frontline health care staff in the province. Uh, do you think that that will pose any potential challenges to ensuring the safety of staff in public and ending the pandemic earlier? Uh, I haven't had a conversation with Vitalite specifically around that, so we may have to touch base with them to make sure that we're uh, aligned and on the same page. Uh, but certainly, that would be their own workplace um, guidelines. Do you have a follow-up, Mr. Jakes? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if, if a lack of mandatory vaccines anywhere in the province uh, would pose any potential challenges to ensuring the safety of staff and the public. 
Well, the vaccine protects the person who's vaccinated from getting COVID-19. Um, and in terms of, you know, shedding the virus, if they were to get infected, uh, again, if they're wearing their proper um, personal equipment, et cetera, personal protective equipment, again, those are conversations that are going to have to happen with the, 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 um, the regional uh, authorities themselves. Uh, I, I don't see mandatory, for the public anyway, I don't see mandatory vaccination being something that we would put in place, but certainly there would be restrictions on certain types of activities that people will want to participate in potentially, uh, but that would be at the discretion of, uh, of the, the things like travel and airlines and things like that. Thank you, Mr. Jakes. Bobby Jean McKinnon. Yes, thank you. This is for either Dr. Russell or Ms. Minister Cardi. Uh, we know there are positive cases at two schools in Woodstock. Can you please explain why the third school in the community is operating as normal when students there have siblings at, others, at the other schools and staff uh, have children who attend the other two schools? Well, all of the public health staff and teams over the weekend did an extensive amount of contact tracing. So all of the people that would have been asked to self-isolate after that 48-hour period was over would be people who had been a close contact of the cases. So if there was no close contact identified, that, then they didn't have to stay home. Uh, and sometimes for operational reasons, if there are too many staff or too many students that have to self-isolate, then that's why they would continue to not be uh, uh, in the classroom. Ms. McKinnon, do you have a follow-up? Yes, I do. Thank you. Um, Minister Carty, various schools have been emailing parents suggesting they plan ahead for homeschooling, which would occur at the red level, but Premier Higgs uh, has said he doesn't believe the province will have to go to red, that orange will be sufficient. So why are the schools doing this, is, and is it at your direction? Thanks for the question. No, we've had... Uh, some districts and some schools have gone above and beyond in terms of taking precautions, which is totally fine. And you know, the Premier was very clear as well. He said, if we have to, we would move to red, but we're doing everything we can to avoid that. And one of the things that's really marked our success throughout this has been everyone who can, using their position of authority, large or small, to do the right thing. And so when I hear that some schools are encouraging their teachers, encouraging their school community to take additional steps to make sure that students have got materials at home, that to me just seems sensible at a time when we don't know what the virus is going to throw at us tomorrow. None of us do. And it's that lack of clarity that makes extra planning extra important. The reason why some schools have decided to ask uh, students to work at home uh, or be, to be registered to uh, work at home in case we went to red. And I think that's a very uh, reasonable as a, as a request. I mean, the people have decided to do everything they can. And in some cases, they've decided that if ever the virus came uh, into a school tomorrow, that we want to make sure that learning can continue. Let's see, Madam McKinnon, Gilles Duval. Yes, listen, we know that in the Edmondson area, there are two businesses since this morning are have slowed down and will not allow customers in in those businesses. And we know that when it's a school or a nursing home, we know that it's other businesses must report when they think there's a, an outbreak in their business, but they also uh, report. Normally, if people have been exposed to COVID-19 in a public area, public health will request this. So people who must stay at home, that's uh, public health that asks them to do that. There aren't any other steps that a business must take except uh, whatever information is given uh, for the people to either to stay at home if they're in close contact. Okay, Mr. Devadis, uh, 
follow up? Yes. Yes, one of the businesses on its uh, pa Facebook page said they would be closed two weeks, and the other one said simply left a note in the in the uh, door that they were closed for now. So they haven't really said any more about uh, why they were closed. I mean, should people watch out for themselves? Well, public health uh, would have done some investigating to make sure that no other people were at risk for COVID-19. If people were at risk, then public health has to direct those people to self-isolate. And if it's not possible to contact them, they would have made a public notice. But as far as I know, there was no public notice. So if there are any other reasons that uh, a business would have to close or people can't work, really the safety of the people has to be maintained according to public health protocols. Mr. Duval, thank you. Past Pascal Rechnog. Yes, my question is for Dr. Russell. Same question of, that Andrew Waugh asked uh, earlier, but in French. I'd like to know why New Brunswick has so many COVID-19 cases while the other Atlantic provinces uh, don't have quite as many. I think somebody wasn't on mute, but still, as... So as I said to Andrew, I thought the reason that we had an increase in cases uh, with the holidays is that, first of all, many people were traveling here from outside of New Brunswick, and we knew that before the holidays, about there were 4,000 to 5,000 people would self-isolate due to traveling, but during the holidays, about 8,000 people were supposed to self-isolate. So if there were citizens who did not self-isolate properly and safely, uh, certainly there would be cases due to traveling, uh, but we also clarified with our messages that we didn't want people to gather with more than 20 people including their own bubble. And the reason for that was that if during the holidays they always saw the same 20 people, there would be no more than 20 people on the list of close contacts. If anybody ever developed COVID-19 symptoms, but we've seen gatherings where people uh, had symptoms and sometimes uh, the risk was brought into these gatherings. We didn't want to see that, but... It was the case, and there were people also who went to work while they were symptomatic. So if they don't wear their masks at work and people have symptoms, that's how the virus can get transmitted. And so these are situations that we saw as well. There were cases linked to travel. So that's what we saw when we saw the, the spreading of uh, of the virus. Uh, Mr. Renos, is there a follow-up question? Yes. Uh, at this point, do we think there might be mass uh, screening? No, not at this time. The, uh, the discussions I've had with our epidemiologists and other um and other medical officers is that really it's uh, we don't see the transmission as that problematic at this point. If we were truly worried about missing people, then certainly we could do that. But at this time, all people with symptoms, if they are immediately uh, tested, that's what we want to see happen. If people could have the COVID app, that would also help us uh, track down uh, close contacts and also stay home if you have symptoms. Thank you, Mr. Oh, I just want to add uh, the other reasons that we might see these cases in New Brunswick. We have, we are the ones who are bordering Quebec and there are many people who come from other parts of Canada uh, through that uh, border. And also there's our border with Maine and other parts of the United States. Thank you, Mr. Reshnug. Mia Urquhart, CBC. 
Bruce. My question is for Dr. Russell. You mentioned that the COVID dashboard will soon include vaccination numbers and be updated weekly, but why not do what some other provinces are doing and update it daily as you do with other statistics? Well, have you ever watched a kettle boil? It takes a while. Uh, we, we are really getting a very small number of vaccines on a weekly basis, so it really wouldn't make sense for us to do it on a daily basis because our shipments only come in once a week at this point in time. Follow up, Ms. Urquhart? I do. This one is for Minister Cardi, please. You have asked parents to cancel or not walk out of travel plans for March break. Given what Dr. Russell has said about avoiding all unnecessary travel, if people ignore your request and choose to travel, what repercussions will they face when they return? We've been making it, uh, thanks for the question, we've been making it increasingly clear that travel is the source, obviously, of COVID-19 into our province. And the more that we can hold it back, especially as cases rise around us, the better off we're going to be. Anyone who thinks it's a smart idea to go on a March break holiday in light of what Dr. Russell has said, in light of the evidence from around the world, is committing an act of selfishness against their family, against people in their community, and against the people in this province. They're draining healthcare resources from people who need it, and they're exposing themselves as people not worthy of the title of citizens. Pay attention to what public health is saying because we want to try and keep people in this province as healthy and alive as possible during this pandemic. So in terms of specifics, I was pretty clear last year when we closed down the school system around March break that we had expectations for how people would behave upon their return. And that did not involve going to school. So the more that people decide to ignore public health, ignore the safety and well-being of the people they care for, the more there are going to be consequences. And no one wants to be in a position to be talking about this. We need to pay attention to the rules for the last few weeks so we can get through this, so we can go on holiday, so we can take off masks, so we can resume a normal life. But if we start pretending that we can do that before the pandemic's behind us, it's like hopping off a boat when you're still 500 meters from shore, you're going to get wet. Stay on board follow the rules, and we'll get through this. En bref, il pas beaucoup de temps pour les gens qui... I really don't have time for the people who think the rules don't apply to them. People who decide to take a vacation and want to take part in anti-mask protests and, and to show such behavior by people who are deplorable and dangerous because they, they pose a risk to the health and welfare and lives of people in New Brunswick. So I hope that for the next few weeks, the people will continue to follow public health guidance so we can get out of this pandemic. It's not the time to take vacation. I mean, we all want to take vacation and all that, but that's why we have the rules for now. And I'm asking people over the next few days, next few weeks, and next few months, follow public health guidance. Merci, Monsieur le Ministre. Harry Forstel, CBC. This is for Dr. Russell. Dr. Russell, you mentioned today at the end of your opening remarks the need for kindness and empathy. From the first day of this pandemic, your office has expressed concern for the mental health of New Brunswickers. So what's being done right now to assess that need and to address it? And how important is it, especially in this traditionally psychologically stressed post-holiday period? Well, we've known from the very early days of the pandemic that mental health was going to be an issue. So we have information on our website uh, that we provided very early on. We continue to try to re-emphasize that uh, in terms of accessing services and help. Um, and even before the Christmas holidays, uh, we knew that that is a particularly bad time. Separate from the pandemic, uh, on a yearly basis, we see an increase in, in needs for uh, people with mental health issues. So. As of right now, um, again, I don't see there being much change in what we've been doing in terms of our approach. Uh, I know it is a huge priority, and I know that, again, whatever resources we have, we are putting towards um, improving mental health uh, services. That's an ongoing um, uh, an ongoing. Um, 
uh, some ongoing work that we've been doing. Um, so I don't really have anything to add other than there are many resources available online to tap into. Thank you, Dr. Mr. Forstel. Do you have a follow-up today? Yes, just very quickly for Minister Cardi. Minister, what steps has your department taken to address the mental health needs of students uh, once again in this particularly difficult uh, uh, period post-Christmas? Thanks, Harry, for the question. So the first thing that we're doing to try and deal with the mental health crisis is by keeping schools open, which is why it's so important that everyone else contribute to that effort so that we can make sure that our young people have got the chance to live as close to a normal life despite the restrictions that are in place. So uh, since the school year began last September, we put in place additional supports for mental health, both, both uh, centrally and at the school level, uh, offering uh, uh, hotlines and numbers that students can call and access. We're making sure we're in much more regular contact than usual with folks uh, involved in uh, counseling and other tasks related to mental health in the schools, making sure teachers have additional information as well. And this is all part of a general effort setting aside COVID-19 to try and make sure we deal with the mental health challenges that are becoming an ever increasing problem across our school system. So I hope that uh, gives a little bit of an answer to your question. But again, the biggest thing we can do for mental health right now is end this pandemic by following Dr. Russell's rules and making sure that we put this behind us. I'll pull the, pull the just so for the people in French, for mental health, we have we put in new resources starting as early as last September. And of course, we also had resources for both students and uh, the teachers. And the most positive thing we can do to improve mental health for students and teachers is to make sure schools can stay open. That's the way everyone can take part in supporting the school system. So if everybody could think in that way, then things should work out. Voilà la fin de notre mise à jour. Merci beaucoup tout le monde. That concludes today's update. Thank you very much.